I'm Jacob Heilbrunn, the editor of the National Interest Magazine, which recently published an essay as our cover story by Dimitri K. Symes called The Perfect Storm, The Age of Upheaval, which looks at the impact that the coronavirus is having on geopolitics, on America, and the rest of the world. And Symes argues that it is ushering in a fundamental change, pushing nations to focus more on their sovereignty and weakening the impulses towards globalization that were so touted in the 1990s. As our other speaker, we have Joe Nye, an emeritus professor at Harvard, the author of many books and the originator of the idea or the concept of soft power. He will argue that au contraire, there is in fact a need more than ever for globalization. Our ground rules today will be that we will open with five to seven minutes introduction from each speaker, beginning with Dimitri Symes and then with Joe Nye. And with that, I'd like to ask Dimitri to begin. Uh, Jacob, thank you very much. Uh, in the spirit of uh, humility, I do not know how all of this is going to end. I was uh, on a panel recently on one of TV shows with a distinguished international banker, and I have asked him for his prediction on what is going to happen to the international economy. And he said, look, I am a banker. I am not a pandemic expert. And uh, uh, I can tell you what is going to happen with international economy, in my view, uh, if uh, this situation persists for another couple of months. But I certainly have no idea what is going to happen if it lasts for another couple of years. Uh, so uh, we need to understand that we, at this point, are in the middle of the crisis. History is being written, and our country, the United States, and other major nations, they are writing this history. They are not passive bystanders. And uh, what we are going to learn and what we are going to do obviously is going to have an impact on the future global order. Let me say, however, that if you look at the situation today, we clearly are facing a moment of truth. Again, we're in the middle of the crisis. Uh, it's uh, premature to draw ultimate conclusions. But so far, so very bad. The United States is firehead of all nations in the number of people uh, who got coronavirus. If you look at uh, a number of cases per 100,000, the United States is under two, behind only of Spain. And if you would look at the number of people who die per 100,000, the United States are number seven in the world, number seven, far behind China, far behind Russia, far behind uh, uh, even a country like India. I'm talking far behind uh, with the lowest number uh, being obviously at the top. Uh, I don't think that most Americans were quite prepared to this kind of situation. Most of us thought that the American health system is one of the best in the world. Most of us thought that the American system of government was not only democratic, but was sufficiently efficient to be organized, or to put it more precisely, to get quickly organized in face of a new challenge. I think we need to, to uh, accept as a starting point that so far uh, we have uh, failed miserably. It's very true. Uh, that uh, others also did not quite perform with glory. That there are a lot of questions about Chinese performance, for instance, and about their misleading information. It is also true that some of the statistics coming from the authoritarian countries cannot quite be believed, and maybe the situation is not quite as bad as the numbers seem to suggest. But the bottom line is that we did not perform the way we expected, and in my view, were capable of, in terms of the level of American economic development and in terms of the level of American democracy. So the question is why? 
And the first point I'm trying to make in my piece is that we were not sufficiently focused, that we were not sufficiently disciplined, that we were not honest with ourselves. That we, of course, knew that pandemics happen, that there were three pandemics during the last 20 years. We got plenty of signals, but we simply, under both democratic and republican administrations, were not organized to focus on something that required a major effort, unless we were already dealing with a crisis. We had too many other distracting priorities. It happened on the level of US foreign policy. It also happened on the level of uh, states and communities. Uh, if you would look at how much money was spent, for instance, to absorb illegal immigrants, uh, to spend what was required on uh, education of children, uh, to teach them American customs and American language. If you would look at trillions of dollars, literally, that were spent on this purpose, uh, you begin to wonder what would happen if this money were spent on preparation for the pandemics. And uh, I would say that uh, uh, more generally, if you would look at the congressional decision-making process and the uh, proposals made the administration, you hardly can see that the priority was uh, given to anything was that was not immediate and that was not politically expedient. I think it's very clear that if we want to be safe and if we want to be world leader, we have to be better. We have to be more focused and uh, uh, more uh, honest about our priorities and about our needs. Then uh, if you talk about uh, uh, US foreign policy, uh, there was a lot of talk about the United States taking holiday from history after the end of the Cold War. And I think uh, that uh, this is largely correct. Uh, the United States was pursuing two parallel uh, foreign policy directions. One was globalization, growing interdependence, uh, uh, essentially creating uh, a, a so-called international community. At the same time, there was a growing weaponization of trade. There was a growing introduction of sanctions. There was a growing polarization uh, of uh, 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 not only the so-called international community, but a growing confrontation of major nations. We were talking about uh, liberal world order. Well, for many nations, it clearly did not appear so liberal because the US insistence and the insistence of many nations of the European Union uh, that we have created a uniquely advantageous, progressive uh, and moral uh, uh, model, not only in terms of international behavior, but in terms of how everybody should conduct their own affairs, that certainly created a situation uh, when many nations, including major nations, particularly China and Russia, were increasingly treated as US adversaries over things that were not central to American national interests. Uh, that kind of polarization made it very difficult to work together. There was a naive belief on the part of the congressional bipartisan majority that you can sanction a nation today and work with them constructively tomorrow. No, it was uh, creating serious animosities growing suspicions and was ultimately polarizing international organizations, whether we were talking about the United Nations or whether you are talking about World Health Organization. And there were what issues uh, we were uh, introducing these sanctions and over what issues we were entering into confrontations with other major powers. There are some very serious issues, clearly. The United States has a responsibility, and it is very much in the American interest to protect US allies and to make sure that they would not be subjected to unprovoked aggression. It's not only a question of American obligation, it's a question of vital American interest because you cannot be perceived as a great power and the United States derives considerable advantages of being viewed a great power if you are not loyal to your commitments. Uh, but at the same time, we had a situation uh, when we were penalizing Russia over how they were treating 
uh, the sexual minorities, over how they were conducting their elections, of what they were allowing or not allowing in terms of their media. And the same was happening vis-a-vis -vis China and actually more and more countries. Uh, even the current Prime Minister of India, Mr. Modi, was under US sanctions uh, when uh, uh, he was a state leader and before he became a uh, leader of the whole of India. And I think that we uh, effectively undermined international organizations and uh, made it very difficult for us to be honest with each other, to share vital information, including the, uh, information about pandemics with each other, and essentially created a situation when we were almost bound to respond to the pandemics strictly by uh, national efforts with very little of international cooperation. So I think that my bottom line is that we have to acknowledge that at this point we do not have the international community. We have sovereign states pursuing their national interests. We have to acknowledge uh, that while democracy is very important, uh, freedom of countries to select their own path of development is also important. It is a question of their self-interest. It's also very often is viewed as a question of other countries' dignity. And if we want to be an effective global leader, we have to recognize sovereignty and dignity of others. And in that case, if we would be able to have this policy adjustment, then I think we can try to reform international organizations and to make them more effective. But you cannot make international uh, organizations more effective if you per pursue arbitrary confrontational policies over issues that are really peripheral to American interests. Thank you. Dimitri, I'd like to thank you for that sweeping exposition and urge anyone who is further interested as well to read the new issue of the National Interest containing your essay for now, I would like to ask Joe Nye for his take on the coronavirus and its implications for the global order. Well, first of all, let me say that uh, I admire Petrie and his essay and agree with a lot of it, even if not all of it. Um, and I particularly agree with his opening point that we need humility. Uh, all we can do at this stage is uh, not predict what will happen after this uh, coronavirus episode or pandemic is tapered off. Uh, I think it's interesting that um, there's so much we don't know about the coronavirus. Is it seasonal? Will it have many waves? When do you get to herd immunity? When will vaccines really be widespread? Uh, we don't know any of that. And similarly, the other thing that will have a big effect on geopolitics is the economic depression, which is being triggered off. And the one thing that seems likely is it's not going to be V-shaped. Um, it may be an L or it may be a W, but it's not, we're not coming back early uh, economically. And that means that we, we know that the political implications uh, of really bad economic conditions, uh, as we saw in the 30s, can be transformative. So that's humility. Um, the other point, though, where I disagree slightly is Dimitri said we're in the middle of this crisis. I think, in fact, we're early. We're on uh, basically in act one of a multi-act play. And uh, we, we really, if we think back to 1918 as an analogy with the so-called Spanish flu, uh, it's interesting that uh, more people died in the second wave in 1918 than in the first wave. And of course, more people died from the Spanish flu than died in World War I with all four years apart. Um, but one of the things that's always intrigued me is that the political implications of the pandemic itself in 1918 were far less than the effects of World War I. Uh, there weren't transformative changes because of the pandemic. Uh, and that, I think, leads one to raise the question of, as we speculate about the future, uh, we often assume that big events are big causes, therefore must have big effects. Not necessarily. Uh, sometimes small causes have big effects and vice versa. Uh, in that sense, I think the, the 
trying to ask, what are we going to see after this crisis? Um, one speculation one often hears is that it, there's going to be a geopolitical transformation in which China passes the U.S. Uh, I don't think so. Um, in the article that I wrote in uh, uh, Foreign Policy, I argued that uh, I thought what you'd see is is um, a continuation of existing trends rather than a reversal of trends, and that uh, uh, there were certain geopolitical advantages that the United States had in geography, demography, energy, technology, the strength of the dollar, deep financial markets, and so forth, which I don't think were going to be changed by the by the crisis. Um, I think on that idea, though, of, of existing trends being reinforced rather than reversed by the, the crisis, as we've seen it so far, um, I think we will see less globalization, but a different type of globalization. There was already a selective decoupling in economic integration, particularly in trade related to high technology. I think that'll continue and be accentuated. But I think there's a great danger of people thinking that globalization, uh, which I define as interdependence at intercontinental distances, is all economic. It's not. There's also ecological globalization. Uh, and what is a pandemic if not ecological globalization? And these, and climate change is another example. These are forces that respond to uh, the technology of transportation and communication and uh, then obey the laws of physics and biology, not the laws of politics. So we may have much less of what you might call the good type of globalization and much more of what you might call the bad type of globalization. That's a reason why you ought to be thinking about the danger of another trend uh, which is going to be reinforced, which is the worsening of U.S.-China relations. We have lots of problems with China, but we also have some areas where unless we and China develop cooperation, we're not going to be able to solve these new ecological globalization problems by ourselves. Uh, you can't do anything about uh, uh, climate change unless you work with China. China and the U.S. together, 40% of carbon dioxide gases and greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And similar, we've seen that you can't wall off a pandemic along national boundaries. So I think there's a good reason to regret the trend, which I think is being reinforced, which is the worsening of US-China relations. So I would, if you ask me my prediction, I don't know, but if you ask me my speculation, it's that we're going to see more populism. We're going to see uh, that will probably reinforce sovereignty, but the sovereignty won't deal with the major issues such as ecological globalization. And uh, we're going to see worse relations with China, and that's going to greatly diminish our capacity to deal with the real security threats we face. It really is ironic to think that as a society, uh, we spend, uh, you know, over 700 billion on uh, military defense and virtually nothing on public health in comparison. And yet we've killed more people in this pandemic crisis than we killed in the Vietnam War. Uh, and I think if you ask what, how do you explain the point that the United States, which has uh, first rate biomedical capacities and first rate hospital systems, is rate, rated down there with third world countries in performance, as Dimitri Proper said. And I think the absence is, of leadership is the answer, that uh, we have fumbled and shifted blame and not had a significant or consistent strategy. And that has put us down there with the third world category. Um, if one asks, is there a way out of this, you can imagine a type of leader, such as those which I describe in my new book, Do Morals Matter? Uh, Presidents in Foreign Policy from FDR to Trump. If you look at the leaders that we had in that period after World War II, they put America's interests first. The key moral question is how they defined America's interests. 
and they defined it very broadly. So for example, the Marshall Plan was in America's interest. We transferred nearly 2% of our GDP. It was in America's interest, but it was in Europe's interest as well. And that provided us a basis of hard and soft power uh, in terms of winning in the Cold War. Uh, you would hope that a leadership today would say, if we don't know much about the coronavirus and it may produce a reservoir uh, in the poor third world countries, which will overflow back northward on a seasonal basis, then you could make a case that a Marshall Plan for poor countries to deal with the COVID-19 threat is in our interest and in their interests at the same time. But that is so far outside the realm of thought of our current leadership that we're, move, we're missing the opportunity to accomplish what American presidents did in the period after World War II. I find this sad. So my, my, uh, my speculation is a speculation which doesn't have a particularly happy ending, even though I think the Americans, while damaged by this, will still be ahead of the Chinese. But that's not the measure of merit that we should be looking for. We should be looking for whether we've had leadership which has risen to the scope of this particular challenge uh, and can deal with future challenges of ecological globalization. And I think the answer is we don't see it. And uh, in there, I think Dimitri and I come out more or less at the same place, though with different starting points. Well, thank you, Joe. I'm very grateful to you for that uh, forceful discussion. And uh, I should discharge my duties as moderator now and say that we also welcome questions and that there's a Q&A tab at the top of your screen that you can press and write a question in and we will endeavor to pose it to our two distinguished panelists. I'd first like to ask Dimitri, what do you think about Joe's response? Do you think that America has perhaps reached its high water mark and will not be the superpower that it was in the past? Is that the scenario we're now starting to see? Well, uh, first, let me say that uh, uh, in my view, what Joe said was much more than just a response. Uh, he needless to say wrote his own very important article, which makes a very strong case about what globalization was and what globalization should be. Uh, and uh, Joe is one of uh, rare people uh, in uh, our field who uh, is both very creative and very disciplined. There are a lot of people who are disciplined uh, and uh, there are some who are creative, but to be both uh, is truly a rare gift and it's a pleasure and privilege Joe, to, for me to be on the same panel with you. And I agree with most of the things Joe said uh, including uh, a kind of the United States suffering from a crisis of leadership. And this is at the center, in my view, of our problems. But what does it mean specifically? Uh, I uh, will not give you, Jacob, a long response. This is not the right time and the right format. But let me say simply that uh, our polarization created a totally vicious situation when no administration can do something really important, something really daring, something that would cost a considerable amount of money, unless uh, it is either self-evident, uh, like uh, during the current pandemics, that you have no choice but to do it, or if you reach the lowest common denominator, which makes whatever you are trying to do next to irrelevant. Uh, I also uh, have to say, that while uh, it was at our center that candidate Trump has delivered in 2016 his first foreign policy speech. As you know, Jacob, well, uh, not a single member of our board, myself included, uh, really did uh, support Trump. Uh, we had our reservations about him, particularly about his uh, political style. Having said that, he is the only president we got and uh, uh, to subject him to a kind of aggressive scrutiny, to a kind of constant assault to which he was suggested during last uh, uh, four years, almost four years, 
you cannot do it without paying a considerable price as a country. Uh, uh, we were not just uh, uh, assaulting Donald Trump. We were assaulting the American government. We were making it virtually impossible for Trump, even if he would be capable of that otherwise, which we do not know, even if he was capable of having uh, a systemic thinking and being able to focus on the pandemic threat. We simply created a political system in the country when uh, disciplined thinking, creative approach, forward-looking strategy are next to impossible. Uh, in the world arena, I think Joe is absolutely right. Uh, he made a strong case in his piece uh, that the United States in most respects remains a paramount country. Uh, I can see how the United States uh, was already damaged during this crisis and maybe damaged even more. But China hardly came uh, as a hero. Uh, and uh, they're being praised in some parts of the world, particularly in Russia. But it's very clear that they did not quite level with the United States. It's very clear that they are not still providing full information. And I also have to say that they are doing something, and Joe mentioned it in his piece, they are becoming a little bit too assertive for their own good. One thing that worked for China in the past, that uh, China's neighbors, in contrast to Russian neighbors, did not particularly feel that China was a threat. But now China is begin beginning to speak uh, literally and uh, using military force with a much stronger voice. And this is beginning to worry a lot of Chinese members, ironically, uh, Russia included. And if China uh, uh, kind of... Uh, continues in this vein. They may, of course, help the United States uh, politically, but we cannot change Chinese conduct. We have to think about our own course, and I think that we need to adjust it in a number of directions. I already talked about it. Joe, would you like to respond to that? Well, I, I, I largely agree with, with what Dimitri said. I think the polarization in the American uh, body politic uh, is partly Donald Trump's fault, but not just Donald Trump's fault. And therefore, the problems of consistent leadership uh, are reflective of that division. I, I, I once uh, asked Lee Kuan Yew, uh, I sat on a board with him, and we see each other regularly, and I once asked him, uh, do you think China is going to pass the U.S.? And he said, no, I don't think so. They're going to try, but I doubt it. And I said, why? And he said, because you can draw on the talents of all the world and can recombine them with a uh, diversity which leads to a creativity that's impossible with ethnic Han nationalism. This, of course, is coming from an ethnic Han. Uh, but what I worry about is if immigration and that ability to recombine the world's best has been one of our great sources of strength. Uh, are we going to kick that away? I hope not, but uh, that worries me. And the other reason that uh, Lee Kuan Yew's prediction and might be wrong uh, is if we kick away our alliances. Uh, the great strength we've had is the ability to form alliances and, and uh, use multilateral organizations. Uh, and. Uh, in the last few years, we've been weakening that. So we have some major assets. What worries me is that uh, because of our internal divisions and policies, we may be losing them. Well, we have some excellent questions. I'd like to pose the first one from Ambassador Stapleton Roy, who asks, how important will the outcome of the US presidential election be on how the coronavirus affects the global order. Would you like to take that first, Joe? Well, I think the, uh, the damage to American reputation and soft power has already been quite considerable. Uh, but I do think that if you had a change of government in November and a new government that basically tried to organize uh, a more international multilateral response, we could recover some of that. Uh, Kevin Rudd, the Australian former Australian prime minister, had suggested a group of multilateral seven, as he called it, to take the lead on this. Uh, 
uh, when a group met at the UN last week, it was interesting that the US, China, and Russia all failed to join in the pledge. But if the US government changed this position on that, we could not only regain some of our soft power, but if you take seriously my concern about the poor countries of the South becoming a seasonal reservoir for resurgence of COVID-19, we could avoid the damage that might come that way. So I do think that the election in November could make a difference, uh, but we'll see. I don't, I, you know, it's, you don't want to overpromise, but I think we're on such a poor path now that it, it could be an improvement. Dimitri, would you like to tackle that? Well, uh, today, uh, President Trump had a long conversation on the phone with uh, uh, President Putin, promised Russia assistance uh, with uh, pandemics and dedicated interest in working together on arms control issues. As I understand, uh, he made clear that he was not interested in any uh, comprehensive arms control agreements without Chinese uh, cooperation, which is uh, unlikely. But at least uh, Trump did indicate that as far as Russia is concerned, particularly if he is reelected, his position may be more forthcoming than it was so far. Conversely, of course, in China, he is taking a very strident position. And uh, uh, ironically, the more uh, confrontational he is with China, uh, the more uh, uh, Russia uh, may be interested in a kind of uh, running a hard bargain with the United States because they would feel in Moscow that the United States uh, may need Russia against China. So uh, it's not enough to offer an olive branch to one of adversarial powers. I think you need a more comprehensive approach where you would uh, defend US interests in a very tough and if required even ruthless manner, uh, but uh, at the same time with a kind of uh, diminish uh, your uh, polemical zeal and be more realistic about what you can accomplish. We know what to expect from Trump, actually not quite, because uh, he was under heavy political pressure. What he would do is, if re-elected uh, is anybody's guess. We, uh, regarding Russia, at least, uh, I think he would be more flexible. I am not sure about China. With Joe Biden, well, he's trying to compete rhetorically, at least, with Trump in terms of being tough on China. And uh, he is uh, almost parading his hostile attitude to Russia. I do not know how you can have any kind of uh, meaningful international order, how you can have any viable international organizations if you would uh, uh, almost welcome having China and Russia as adversaries. Uh, they may be uh, uh, appropriate adversaries because of their conduct and because of their moral standing. But if you want to have any kind of meaningful, stable international order, which we need to deal with pandemics and other challenges, a state of permanent confrontation with two major nuclear powers is not in the American interest. Well, that provides a nice segue into a question from Nick Gavozdev, the former editor of the National Interest, now at the Navy War College, who asks, what is the likelihood that some major powers will decide they can absorb the costs either of a pandemic or global warming, reckoning that this will knock out a major competitor that cannot adapt as easily? And he asks, will this in fact limit international cooperation? Joe, would you like to tackle that? Well, it's an interesting speculation uh, that Nick makes. Um, you could imagine, for example, um, Putin saying, if I could, if the Americans and the Chinese have both damaged themselves by their responses, and if global warming actually opens up large parts of Siberia, as well as the Northern Passage that helped me, uh, maybe I should try to torpedo cooperation in that area. And on the pandemic, uh, the same thing. Let, let the Chinese and the Americans go on with their slanging match and criticizing each other. Uh, and uh, it's sort of like playing poker with the, when you get the last three hands of being high-low, being the, the outside hand. It's a tempting strategy. However, 
uh, the question is, does it give enough credit to these problems of ecological globalization that I mentioned? For example, it may be that you open up parts of Siberia and the Northern Passage, but if you melt the permafrost, it may turn out to be far more damaging net. And similarly, if you affect the ocean, the rivers that flow northward, that may have untold damages. So, uh, and as for the pandemic, so what we see so far is that uh, uh, Russia has not done all that well, and it may still have a good deal of damage still to be suffered. So it's a, it's a plausible strategy if you're thinking of this as a hand of poker. I don't, I think the uncertainties and the, uh, uh, the unintended uh, consequences are just too risky to make it a realistic strategy. Dimitri, what, what's your take? I basically agree with John. That... Okay. We have another provocative question from Chris, Christian Witten, who frequently writes for the National Interest website. He asks, which major country's political system is most at risk from crisis or collapse, particularly in the economic sphere. How would you like, what would your response be, Dimitri? Well, I think that the American economic system uh, is hardly at the risk of collapse. Uh, I see a lot of problems and a lot of uh, difficulty ahead of us, but collapse in my view is not a realistic option. In the Russian case, uh, you see that they're trying to introduce many policies somewhat similar to what is being introduced in the United States, including uh, social protection, protection of small business, uh, help to unemployed, uh, uh, and etc. The problem for Russia, of course, is uh, that the economy is much, much smaller uh, than that of the United States. Uh, the uh, resources are limited under best circumstances. And now they have to deal with the collapse of the oil market, and they're very heavily dependent. They're very heavily dependent upon energy prices. So I think that if somebody is in danger, I wouldn't say it's uh, the, the Russian economy. It would be uh, the Putin system of government, uh, which is uh, not uh, uh, democratic, at least the way we understand democracy. But it is also not a tyranny. It's a kind of uh, a soft, populist authoritarianism, where it is essential for Putin to maintain support of the majority of population. Uh, and he cannot maintain the majority of population uh, if people feel uh, that uh, uh, literally they are losing their livelihood and the government can provide them with only promises. Uh, Joe said uh, some very unflattering things about American health system. I tried to basically to do the same but we kind of know how it can be repaired with the right policy and with the right will uh, in Congress. In the Russian case, you have to appreciate that in 40% of their hospitals, they don't have rural hospitals, I should add. They don't have running water. I did not misspeak. In 40% of the rural hospitals, according to Russian official statistics, they don't have running water. It would be very difficult for them uh, to do much better, at least to do much better quickly with their health system. And I think it would be difficult for Putin to deliver. And I think his basic instinct would be he's a very cautious politician, ruthless, uh, not particularly burdened by concern about democracy, uh, but he does care about public opinion. And I think he's going to be very cautious. He would not want to rock the boat with the United States and would be looking for, for a kind of policy which would not lead to a further isolation of Russia. Joe, I wonder, is your take on the American economy similar to Dimitri's, or do you take a more uh, pessimistic view of the future? No, I think the American economy has basic underlying strengths, um, uh, which will allow us to recover, though probably not as quickly as people hope. But for example, in demography, uh, we're one of the few countries among rich countries which still has a rising workforce. And uh, 
China's labor force has already peaked. Russia has demographic decline and so forth. Similarly, with uh, uh, a lot of other aspects of the American economy, there are underlying strengths, but they're, they're not going to save us in the short term. They're going to be basically several years before we get there. But the, I, let me just mention quickly the question, the issue. I mean, I defer to Dmitry about Russia. He knows so much more than I. I'll just agree with him. But on China, some people said this could be China's Chernobyl moment. Uh, and I think that's probably exaggerated. I think Xi Jinping and the Communist Party of China are better established than that implies. But a friend of mine who I used to work with in, uh, when I ran the National Intelligence Council um, pointed out to me that the, what the coronavirus did to China was expose the fact that they really don't have a public health system or a medical care system, and that to repair this is going to take a significant investment as a proportion of Chinese GDP. So when we say China will just invest further and further in the military or, or the Belt and Road Initiative and so forth, what this person pointed out is that China may find that because of this weakness of its medical and public health system, uh, it's gonna be much more constrained than we realize. That's well short of a charitable moment, but it does indicate that there are going to be some effects on Chinese politics. Well, I have another provocative question to pose from George Beebe, who is the vice president of the Center for the National Interest, former head of the Russia desk at the C Russia analysis at the CIA. He asks, during the Cold War, the US and USSR did not focus on attempting to cooperate in combating shared threats. Rather, their bilateral diplomacy focused on ensuring their competition did not spiral out of control. Then he asks, should the US emulate that approach today towards China and Russia? Joe, you might as well take it since you're right on the screen. Well, I, I think uh, we ought to, uh, be setting in place uh, mechanisms uh, both with Russia and with China, uh, similar to the Instant at Sea Agreement, where even though we had great ideological hostility in 1972, we both realized that the practice of buzzing each other's ships and planes too closely ran the risks of escalation that neither of us really wanted. Uh, you can imagine, for example, in relation to cyber conflict, uh, where we both say, okay, we're not going to have an arms control treaty in cyber with either China or with Russia, but you could find something where you say, here's some rules of the road that if you go beyond this level, we're going to react, A, and B, we're going to set up a communications process that goes with it. So I think there's a lot to be said for that approach. I still would add to it uh, uh, a more active approach on such things as climate change, uh, pandemics, and global financial stability, which I think uh, we and the Russians or the Soviets didn't share much of an economy in the Cold War. Uh, but we do still share quite a bit of an economy with China in this period. Dimitri, I wonder what you think of George's return to a Cold War mode of thinking rather than a more ambitious rapprochement as, as, was try, as some administrations tried to affect after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Is, well, is George on the right track? Well, George was uh, right in describing uh, U.S.-Russian relations during the Cold War. Of course, there was very little uh, of real interdependence. And of course, both uh, countries uh, uh, did not really believe uh, that uh, uh, they could do something meaningful, uh, major together. Uh, uh, we are in the same situation today. The difference is that during the Cold War, we were honest with ourselves. And we were not pretending that uh, we were seriously trying to work with Russia on any common interests, on any global challenges. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, China, for instance, uh, we uh, did not pretend that uh, the United States was uh, interested in working with Russia against China. Uh, today we are uh, in a situation 
uh, when we have common geopolitical interests with Russia, if we are talking about the rise and the growing assertiveness of China. And of course, we have things like uh, pandemics and climate change. Uh, and that is why I'm saying we are facing a moment of truth. We should decide what is more important for us, to be able to work with Russia when we have common interests, do we have important common interests? And if we do have such interests and want to work together, then we have to understand that our current policy of treating Russia as an adversary uh, or across the board, uh, that this policy uh, uh, cre cre uh, creates a self-fulfilling prophecy and we will not have Russia when we may need it most. Uh, whether it is acceptable or unacceptable in terms of U.S. national interests, I think is one of fundamental questions. And I don't think this question was ever debated in Congress. I never heard uh, about a congressional hearing when they were debating sanctions against Russia, uh, when somebody would say, but wait a second, what would sanctions cost America? What does it mean uh, that every significant member of the Russian legislature is now under sanctions and cannot even travel to the United States. Uh, is this something that is in our interest? I hope we will have a, a, a kind of conversation, uh, particularly after the elections. Well, we have a question from veteran Washington journalist, James Kitfield, who asks, does the coronavirus pandemic in fact, make conflict with either Russia or China more rather than less likely in coming years. Dmitry? Well, I was hopeful when uh, this whole situation started. I was hopeful that we would have uh, enough common sense and enough uh, political will uh, to decide that we are in the same boat and there are certain things we have to do together because uh, these things are more uh, uh, important in terms of U.S. fundamental interests that what uh, divides us. Now, uh, I think we're going uh, in the opposite direction, particularly with uh, China. Uh, when I watch this uh, polemics uh, between China and, and the United States, I'm not so much asking myself who is right, or more uh, appropriately to say who is more wrong, who is exaggerating more. But I do think that th this direction of our political confrontation with China is certainly inconsistent with any conversation about international cooperation. China may not be a good partner in terms of international cooperation, but China certainly can be uh, a very formidable adversary. As uh, Ronald Reagan used to say, it takes two to tango. And if the world's second uh, superpower would become a permanent or semi-permanent adversary of the United States, it certainly can create all kind of general tendencies, adversarial tendencies, which uh, in the case of any kind of local explosion may lead to very dangerous and very profound consequences. Just remember Sarajevo. Wonder, I assume that you don't disagree with Dimitri's fundamental point on China, which, which I share as well. I wonder how do you think can we extricate ourselves from the impasse that we seem to be headed towards? There are many voices in Washington that have been pushing for confrontation with China since really the 1990s when it was, when it was portrayed as a, a new Cold, or Cold War II threat. So I know that you talked previously about your concerns about a deteriorating China relationship. What would you do to address that? Well, first of all, I'd get a, a, a more clear-headed analysis of the problems that China uh, poses to us. Uh, it's equally mistaken to under or overestimate China. Right now, uh, the fashion in Washington is to overestimate China. Uh, and what strikes me is that if you're a bright young staffer, uh, you want to make sure that nobody is more hawkish than you are on China. That's not the basis for solid analysis. That's uh, it's a basis for political careerism and opportunism. Uh, 
So I think the mood in Washington right now is not for a uh, clear assessment of the problems with China to reach a serious strategy. It's uh, basically driven by American domestic politics. That doesn't mean we aren't gonna have to do difficult things with China. We should not let Huawei build 5G in the US. There are areas where we should decouple in the technological sphere. Uh, we should have freedom of navigation operations uh, in the South China Sea. The danger is that we think that you can't have that type of competition and cooperation simultaneously. Uh, Lyndon Johnson uh, used to go very poor, couldn't walk and chew gum at the same time. Sometimes I think the American political elite, foreign policy elite, can't walk and chew gum at the same time. We've got to figure out how do we work with China in the areas where we have common interests and compete with China on the areas where we have geopolitical differences and realize that we can do both simultaneously. And this current uh, hyperphobia about uh, China is not helping us to do a clear analysis. It's doing just the opposite. So to what do you ascribe this uh, sort of recidivist bellicosity towards China? I mean, we've seen waves of it before. What is it when you say we can't walk and chew gum at the same time? Why is that? Why the lurch always towards confrontation? Well, I think in American attitudes, it's more, it's much easier to have a demon to organize against. Uh, you know, in the Cold War, the anti-Sovietism was uh, like a North Star, which gave you the focal point for your grand strategy. We haven't had that kind of a North Star for a strategy uh, since the end of the Cold War. And the net effect of that is people have been looking for simplifications, ways to, to ease things. But in addition to that, uh, China has done some things which uh, added fuel to this fire. I, I gave a speech in Beijing about a year ago in which I said, look, uh, even if Donald Trump had not been elected, there would have been a worsening of US-China relations. Trump was like a man who came along and threw gasoline on a fire that was already smoldering in American public opinion. But if you asked who lit the fire, it was you, uh, you're, with your subsidies to state-owned enterprises, your stealing of uh, American technology, your coercive intellectual property transfer, we are right to take a stronger position on those. But to generalize from that to a general proposition that there's a uh, uh, Thucydides dilemma that we're about to go to war with a rising power, we have to defend ourselves, this is nonsense. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear uh, such strong words, uh, especially directed towards uh, uh, someone that we've published a lot, Controversy is Good. I'd like to push you one step further. What, what you're saying reminds me, well, I'm reminded of D.W. Brogan's famous essay about the illusion of American omnipotence and that we search for a foreign enemy to, to sort of exculpate ourselves from our own deficiencies. And does that in fact uh, menace your own soft power thesis that the United States uh, in recognizing its own limitations may end up turning more inward and be less interested in the kind of international cooperation that you're espousing? Well, I think if we did uh, turn inward, we would indeed undercut our soft power. Um, our values are obviously built into our self-image, our so-called American exceptionalism, but the values uh, also can be attractive to others. And uh, what I try to do in the book on Do Morals Matter is to look back at that period after 1945 and realize that we went much beyond just the hostility to the Soviet Union in terms of promoting a broader set of values in which others could participate. And this led to a lot of people attract, being attracted to the United States. As a Norwegian political scientist put it, uh, uh, there was an American empire in Europe, but it was an empire by invitation. Uh, people wanted us there. 
That's still true in much of Asia. Japanese want us there to balance Chinese power so much that they pay for most of the 50,000 troops that we keep in Japan. What worries me is if we turn inward, if we ignore these alliances, we're basically not only undercutting our own values, but also undercutting the soft power, which attracts others to do things we want. Well, I have a final question for Dimitri from Chris Bort, who asks, when will the US, using Putin's words, come to its senses about its global limitations and seek an accommodation with Russia and China? Is it possible and what would make such a change possible? Uh, well, I am certain that the United States will do this. The only question is when. As Churchill uh, liked to say, that the United States always makes the right decision after trying all the alternatives. And I'm not sure that we have tried all the alternatives yet, uh, at least as, uh, as far as policy toward Russia is concerned. Let me make one point in response to what Joe said. I know that uh, 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 Joe, uh, with his very nuanced approach to policy, when he talks about uh, being able to uh, walk and chew gum at the same time, uh, he does not mean uh, uh, that you can walk and chew gum uh, and uh, expect uh, that uh, no matter uh, uh, whatever else you do, as long as your intentions are pure, the other side would be prepared to walk with you. Uh, that was a very pre popular saying during the Obama administration when they were introducing sanctions against Russia, particularly over Ukraine. They were kind of presenting this as a, a, a very uh, modest and reasonable foreign policy because they did not try to overthrow the Russian government and they were prepared to walk with Russia. But uh, uh, their way of walking and chewing gum looked from Moscow like walking alone uh, and uh, spitting gum in the Russian face. And that was not a very uh, effective policy. Uh, uh, in the case of uh, uh, an issue like Ukraine, it's very clear uh, that Ukraine for Russia is a an existential problem. Uh, Kissinger often talked about that in the past, but I would quote uh, a different person who spoke German, General Ludendorff, who was the most successful, one of the most successful German generals during World War I, and he inflicted most of the humiliated defeats on the Russian Imperial Army. And Ludendorff said, after Russia suffered most of its defeats and was on its knees, he said, and of course, we should not take a Ukraine away from Russia, because then Russia, by definition, would become our enemy for a very long time. Well, we live in a different age. Ukraine became independent, not as a result of any American effort, into the sovereign nation and the member of the United Nations. But when the US Congress makes a huge issue out of Crimea and pretends that we can return Sevastopol uh, uh, well, back to Ukraine, when Sevastopol in effect is the Russian Alamo, and we do understand that there is absolutely nothing uh, we can do short of uh, causing Russian collapse uh, to return Crimea to Ukraine, you have to ask yourself, uh, whatever our intentions, are we pursuing the policy vis-a-vis -vis Russia, which makes uh, uh, working together when we need it? virtually impossible. Well, I would like to thank our two panelists, Dimitri K. Symes, President and CEO of the Center for the National Interest, and Joe Nye, author of Do Morals Matter, a new book, and he is also an emeritus professor at Harvard. I thank both of you, and I thank those of you who have listened to this Zoom session. With that, I'd like to conclude it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.